Hello, welcome to another live stream of Tech Leaders Academy. My name is Sarah and I'm the host of this event today. And besides that, I'm of course also the co-founder of Tech Leaders Academy. This is a platform on which we offer courses, events, streams, and you will also find more content on how to progress in your tech career and also upskill into tech leadership. By the way, in October, we are going to start a new masterclass, especially for tech leads. And the early bird is ending on Saturday. So if you are interested in that, um, you can check out our website. It's called Tech Lead Masterclass. And if you have further questions on the program, you can also write me a DM and then I'm happy to help. So today we are focusing on a very exciting question and we are asking ourselves, what is the next big thing in tech? And this is also very interesting for tech leads because tech leaders should be informed about the latest technology trends, of course, and they should also be able to evaluate which of these new technologies are also interesting to be implemented in the products they are building for, soft, uh, for software development, but also in the data field. And yeah, the question that comes up recently, uh, or let's say since a year is the big gen AI topic, of course. And the question that I have, especially in my mind is, will we still surf on the gen AI wave in 2024? So let's discuss that in, um, yeah, in this live stream today. And as always, if you want to interact with us, you are uh, highly welcome to ask your questions, but also share your opinions with us in the chat. So, and of course, I'm not talking alone. I have a wonderful guest with me. His name is Tarek Madani Mamluk. He works as an innovation engineer at Axel Springer. And at night, he um, says he's a content creator. And what does that mean, actually? Actually, it means he has not one, not two, but even three podcasts or let's say YouTube shows. So he is quite busy in producing content about latest technology trends and how all these trends are influencing our lives, our work, but uh, the whole society as well. And um, yeah, I'm really happy that he's here with us today. Uh, what I want to mention also is that he was nominated uh, for the German Podcast Award. I think it was with one of his podcast shows. And if he is now an, an award-winning podcast host, this is the question and uh, we need to ask him personally. So let's welcome him, him on this stage. Here is Tarek. Welcome, Tarek. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Nice that you're here with us and that you're taking the time and especially you are very professional in content creation. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I have a lot of fun with content creation. If I'm that successful, I'm, I'm not sure. And uh, you're, you're totally right. Um, this one podcast that I'm producing was uh, nominated mm -hmm. for the German podcast prize, but we did not win. Okay. So <laughs> I, I can proudly say we were nominated, but that's all all there is. <laughs> okay. So um, maybe next time. So can you, can you right. apply for it or will you be nominated from a jury or how does it work? Yeah, in this case, um, it was actually that uh, one of my co-producers uh, just like entered us mm -hmm. into this competition and we were selected mm -hmm. uh, or let's say um, they, they considered us for the prize and mm -hmm. then there was no voting. Um, but we, we did not get enough uh, votes of this. But this was really crazy because this was exactly the one podcast that I'm producing that uh, that we are just doing for fun. Mm -hmm. It's a German podcast. It's called Elk Country. Mm -hmm. And we are discussing their uh, Star Wars and fantasy and TV shows and movies and everything without a script, simply like a fun show, uh -huh. simply laughing about it, making jokes, being sometimes even politically incorrect <laughs> <laughs> with some topics. Uh, and, and we are really doing this for fun. And mm -hmm. so it was really weird when we then got the message, oh, by the way, you are nominated for the German Podcast Prize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the other two podcasts, it's it's more about the other passion that you have. So it's more about tech technology uh, and innovation and hypes. Is that, is that right? Yeah, right, right. So one of those podcasts, I, I'm wearing shamelessly my head <laughs> of 
<laughs> that the Tech Review podcast, this is uh, one that is, um, we, we are bringing it out every single week. Mm -hmm. And on this podcast, we're discussing the latest developments in technology. So basically what I'm doing as an innovation engineer, keeping track of what Elon Musk is doing mm -hmm. and what is happening with, with Facebook and Microsoft and OpenAI, of course, but also uh, what we are doing, and I say we, not, not <laughs> we, but the humanity, yeah. humanity is doing uh, colonizing the moon and Mars and quantum computers and all of these topics. And uh, every day we have so many news headlines that we thought, uh, let's talk about this, discussing this. So uh, people don't have to read everything for themselves, mm -hmm. but simply can get like a, a nice discussion about these mm -hmm. topics. And this is the tech review. And also I'm having the Innovation Energy podcast where I take uh, selected topics together with my co-host and we go uh, more in depth. And this is also targeted for uh, let's say um, IT management, mm -hmm. for example, decision makers, because there we are talking about things like drive or um, is OKR overrated mm -hmm. or yeah. uh, th th these topics that are partly technical, but also simply very uh, important to know for people working in this industry mm. and so uh, I, I have like a variety <laughs> of shows that you might like yeah that, that's that's cool actually and uh, what I find really impressive is your whole setup so uh, it's the background it's the camera the microphone the sound it, it, it it's really nice to hear that and uh, it's uh, also a nice appreciation I think for all the watchers and the listeners because uh, it's always good if you have good quality and uh, if you have hosts that are aware of these audio and video quality. Yeah, but you could also say it's over-engineered mm -hmm. and this happens if you put an engineer <laughs> in charge of a podcast, <laughs> yeah. then everything will be over-engineered. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It, it's actually the thing that I enjoy doing. This, this is one of my passion projects. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is not a necessity or someone forcing me to do that, but actually it's, it's fun. It's fun to produce that stuff. Yeah. So um, icebreaker question. As always, I'm starting my interview with an icebreaker question. And I think it also is a quite good question for you for an innovation engineer, because just imagine you could travel through time, like one time, like once, once in your life, you can go there and you can come back. So it's not, not a matter of to decide whether you want to stay in the past or the future. But my question rather is, would you rather go to the past and take one of our latest technologies to the past and teach the people how to use that? Or would you rather go to the future and grab a technology from the future and bring it to our today's life? What would you prefer and why? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that, that is no question at all. I will immediately travel to the future mm -hmm. uh, because I am so... I'm so curious to see what happens next. Mm -hmm. This is the big question. I can I can read history books and I learn everything about uh, history. That's interesting, but I kind of already know that. But I want to see what is going to happen like in 10 years or 20 years. Are we actually going to colonize other pl planets mm -hmm. or uh, is it it? M maybe I can only travel like 10 years to the future, then we have the apocalypse. <laughs> There's no mu not much more future left, I don't know. <laughs> but I think this, this would be super interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't even be that, uh, uh, interested in grabbing a technology, bringing it back to the past. I, I simply want to see what is happening mm -hmm. next. Uh, if, for example, uh, in in the in the sixties, people were imagining the future looks like flying cars through the uh, through the cities and everything. Um, we don't have that yet, but I'm really interested to see if this is going to happen, yeah. or if this stays like science fiction because it's simply um, not what what's the word um, impractical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having flying cars might be totally impractical, and in reality, we will build like tunnels, like Elon Musk is doing in <laughs> in California. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> or like beaming technology from Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now let's shift it a little bit in this direction. So you are not only a podcast host and a content creator, but you're also actually an innovation engineer working for Axel Springer. So could you also give us even more sentences about what are you doing there and how did you become an innovation engineer? Yeah, absolutely. What I'm doing there, uh, I get this question a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually uh, the, the first thing that, that I have to say is uh, what I'm not doing is building like uh, everyday standard technologies mm -hmm. or everyday standard uh, software mm -hmm. yeah, usually or my background is 
software engineering. Mm. I, I studied computer science, and so I am the guy sitting there programming websites and stuff. Um, but, but this was too boring for me, too standard. And so I stopped doing that and started uh, evaluating technologies like blockchains and VR and mm -hmm. quantum computing and AI. So all these things that, are, that have a, a lot of uh, potential benefits, uh, but are not standard yet, even though some of the things I mm -hmm. just said are already standard yet. But this is uh, kind of the role that I took in, in the organization. And I'm really, really thankful um, that, that uh, Axel Springer is also investing heavily in this area and they have budgets uh, so that I can actually do th these things that I'm doing because they are kind of expensive, not expensive mm -hmm. in terms of I'm burning through millions of euros, but um, the things that I'm building, they are research, they are evaluations, they are experiments, simply to understand what technologies have merit, which technologies might be important tomorrow or in, in the next 10 years, let's say it like that. Um, but they are not making money right now, mm -hmm. even though if you have standard technologies, standard portals, uh, let's say a TV station, yeah, it's, it's not innovation to have like a TV station, but it makes money. Mm -hmm. So you need these products, you need these technologies to pay your people. And so this is something that, that we also have. Um, but I'm not working there. I'm not building software there. I'm, I'm looking at what is going to happen next year. Um, and and this, this is amazing. For me, it's the best job that I could imagine. Um, and also important if you and your organization want to stay ahead on the game and want to um, leverage uh, competitive advantages. Uh, because it's always important to see what happens tomorrow. Because sometimes it's about just, let's say, profit, becoming mm -hmm. better. But sometimes it's a question of life and death because yeah. an organization can die if startups pop up that are doing the same thing that you're doing, but way more efficient or way better and you can't compete because you are still using the technologies from, from 10 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, absolutely right. And uh, when exactly did it happen that you became uh, an innovation engineer? Um, yeah, and, and did this, was it an application uh, or did you apply for the job or was it your own idea to create this job and then you pitched it in front of, I don't know, the management or leadership board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of everything what you just said. <laughs> no, it, it's actually it's actually interesting because um, when I started working, when I left university, when I got my first job, I, I wasn't aware that there are these kind of jobs that are not fitting into a standard template. Mm -hmm. um, I, I worked as a software engineer. Later, I worked as an IT consultant. Uh, and I actually started making like a standard career. I became a, a, a team lead. Mm -hmm. And then I became um, a department head. And then I became even a CTO. It mm -hmm. was very, very amazing. I was very proud on uh, what I had on my business card, <laughs> like the <laughs> fancy title and everything. But the thing is, um, the, the higher I grew in this hierarchy, um, the less I was able to do the things that I actually love. And uh, th in, in the end of this journey, um, I saw that my developers <laughs> were doing exactly mm -hmm. all of these things that I wanted to do, but I was busy filling out Excel sheets and doing presentations and all of these things that I actually hate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so um, then I, I uh, talked to um, one person from Axel Springer, actually. So this was the first time that I was doing this job. And he was telling me that he's searching for someone evaluating technologies and mm -hmm. taking a look at what is going to happen next. And this was exactly what I always wanted to do. And so <laughs> this sounds like, like a great thing. And uh, he had the budget for a couple of years. And so I simply said, okay, it's, it was a very hard decision because I had to leave like my, my previous career uh, in, in, in the past mm -hmm. and start this thing. And I, I, I never had this kind of job. And as you said, it, this job did not really exist. And I think it still not really exists um, because wherever you see something like a um, innovation manager or mm -hmm. innovation engineer or something, pe people keep like inventing whatever this means. Yeah. Yeah? And the same for me. I, I wrote the definition of what an innovation engineer is uh, basically by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I think um, innovation scout can also be quite like in a similar box, <laughs> like crazy, Mark. <laughs> like make a short break and give us an explanation why you brought this crazy, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, 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 just make a <laughs> short pause and then we come back because I find it really funny. <laughs> So this is my uh, disrupting mug. <laughs> no, this is basically a, a, a running gag, a running gag uh, from one of my podcasts. Yeah. And my podcast uh, co-host, uh, 
Waschi, Sebastian Waschnik, kudos to you. Um, he brought up this uh, idea of, hey, we have these nerdy mugs. Let's start each episode with presenting one of our nerdy mugs. <laughs> And this one is actually from Star Wars Land. This is uh, the Mythosaur from The Mandalorian. Uh, yeah. And so this is like and, one of our running And decks. I prepared myself as well. Uh, that's the most <laughs> weirdest mug that I have in my cupboard. Uh, it's from uh, the, the um, Christmas market, I think three years, four years ago. And it's for a malt wine. Actually, I have only water with some mint in there <laughs> because it's not yet malt wine season, but next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a nerdy mug, but I think it's it's a bit like my most unusual one that I have. <laughs> it qualifies. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Coming back, <laughs> like break. <laughs> Final break ends here. <laughs> so um, uh, what did we talk about before? It's like, uh, like, do you define the innovation engineer role by yourself in, in a kind of way? And I think it can be a bit similar to an uh, engine uh, innovation scout as well, but more with a technological focus. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though I mean, when you say innovation scout, um, I like create a mental image of yeah. what this actually means. I, I imagine someone going through the market, <laughs> yeah. searching for new products, new technologies. Um, and scouting them mm -hmm. for their individual use cases. Uh, yeah, and it's it's kind of. What, what I do, but more on the technical. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think scouting is a part of your job, but the engineering is as well. Nice. Right, exactly. So um, now the question has to come, generative AI. <laughs> How much of the time that you are spending at work are you spending with generative AI technologies right now? Is it like all over the place <laughs> or is it a, is it a hype still? Yeah, I mean, hype is not bad. Um, of course, there is this hype. Um, the question is how much of this hype will be left over like in one or two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and absolutely, uh, I think um, it's it's not uh, surprising <laughs> that I'm, <laughs> let's say, 95% of my job right now is involving uh, generative AI. This is just the big thing right now. Uh, but before that, I was working uh, with blockchain technologies. And before that, I was working with VR technologies. <laughs> and so um, there are these big technologies um, that need to be evaluated, that need to be worked with. And right now, it is just generative AI. And uh, compared to the others, this one is actually a way bigger, I call it also hype. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a very important hype because this technology is based on natural language. Yeah? We're mm -hmm. talking about these LLMs, large language models, and they introduce new possibilities everywhere where we are using language. And this is basically everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah? Every person uses language in their everyday life. Every use case that we are doing everywhere, be it in science, be it, be it in management, be it in... Um, automotive, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you have a uh, language everywhere. And so this is a technology that penetrates basically all industries. And that's why, of course, there's a lot of hype in there, but it's important for everyone. Yeah, with blockchains, um, everyone was first loving it, but it was very quickly obvious that it did not really touch all the industries mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. People were coming up with news ca use cases which made no sense at all simply to to push this technology yeah. there with language it's different it, it actually fits everywhere mm -hmm. yeah? and that's why of course there is a lot of hype and people are doing exactly the same thing using uh chat gpt for everything and some of these use cases are going to disappear again um but absolutely it, it touches all of the industries i, I compare it more like the emergence of the internet mm -hmm. yeah? this is something where also in the beginning people were very skeptical but the internet is now defining all industries there's no industry that is not somehow related with the internet mm -hmm. is there already one use case i don't know how specific you can talk about it but is there already a use case at axel springer in the field of generative ai that you brought or other people in your in your team brought to production or is it still in this prototyping experimentation phase yeah, yes and no. Um, we have first products uh, based on generative mm -hmm. AI that are in production, even though I would not say that those are like disruptive scenarios. Uh, for example, when um, when access, no, sorry, when uh, 
OpenAI was introducing this concept of plugins mm -hmm. where you were uh, able to connect your business logic of your company to the chat GPT backend. Uh, we were one of the, the first uh, companies in, in Germany mm -hmm. uh, providing like a news plugin in OpenAI. So this was one thing that we were really proud of, mm -hmm. even though this is a very, very small use case. It is um, giving ChatGPT the capability of um, reading like Axel Springer news and telling mm -hmm. you what is in there. It's a cool thing, but it's not really disruptive, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the same thing uh, right now, uh, we, we have a ChatGPT uh, kind of plug-in where when you visit our news sites, um, you can chat with ChatGPT, mm -hmm. but without going to mm -hmm. ChatGPT, the website. Mm -hmm. So and you so, self -hosted. Uh, we're making it. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's basically available mm -hmm. to our users who are not, um, let's say, uh, in, intrinsically motivated to go to ChatGPT.org mm -hmm. and uh, type in there. Oh, also okay. making it uh, available to other people, even though there's not really much magic in that. It's really just the chatbot uh, okay. and some predefined questions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's why on the one hand uh, we are very proud of the release of these features because they are in production but they are not yet uh, the the full extent of what this technology is capable mm -hmm. of uh, so we are still working on those use cases where we say okay here we actually have something that will change this industry forever mm -hmm. and this is going to come yeah what i find very fascinating um with chat gpt especially but with this all gen ai thing is that for me, it was the first time it really became like AI really became mainstream. I can remember when I was driving in the car and uh, the radio moderator was uh, like explaining that he used ChatGPT uh, for, I don't know, uh, planning a birthday party for his child. <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> shit. Now we are really like bringing AI into mainstream because before I have the data background. Of course, I'm thinking about AI and the technologies and data science specifically, which is not originally AI, but I think I was more in there. But then finally, like with within some weeks, everyone was talking about it. Everyone was using yeah. it and trying it out for the very different purposes. What do you think from your perspective, how can like generative AI in general influence us as human beings and us as a whole society? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we we will definitely be impacted by the way that we perceive certain tasks and uh, workloads. Um, and I would compare this with the introduction of um, like book printing. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, back back in the day, uh, people were literally writing books with their hands, making copies, physical copies of, of the book with their hand. When they started printing books, all of these people lost their job, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it was a huge leap mm -hmm. because uh, nobody had to take care of that anymore. And the same thing with uh, manufacturing cars, for example. Uh, you had suddenly these these conveyor belts and it was way easier um, to to build stuff in um, in factories. Yeah? And uh, we kind of have the same situation today where, um, for example, I, I'm working for a media organization. We have uh, a lot of people doing stuff like writing text. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that everyone who's writing text is going to lose their job, but the way that we are going to see this task will change mm -hmm. because this is something that now that our machines are actually mastering the art of language can be automated. And even though we, we can say, ah, there are some things I don't like the style of this uh, of ChatGPT or um, there are some things that are uh, like uh, repeating themselves, mm. some wordings, and uh, we, we can, we are already counteracting this with better prompting and new versions and fine tuning yeah. because we are right now still in the very beginning of this new technology. And so we, we can't rely on, okay, ChatGPT will stay the way that it is for, forever. It's, it's a question of weeks and months mm. until the next version is coming. Yeah. And so uh, certain language based tasks will be automated if we want it or not. Mm. And so this whole um, a point of view on content creation, for example, media, language-based tasks, uh, assisting technologies, um, this this will totally change. And we see uh, now, I, I think I saw today um, a headline where uh, I think Mark Zuckerberg 
introduced new, uh, new uh, version of smart glasses mm -hmm. that are connected to ChatGPT, and so uh, they they can tell you what you're seeing or giving you details of, of stuff that you're seeing. I, mm -hmm. I only like skimmed it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure uh, exactly what is, uh, it is uh, doing. Okay. <laughs> I think th this is exactly what is going to happen. Um, things that we can't even think of yet are going to be automated and assisted. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, I think I cannot <laughs> remember a day since last day, November, uh, when I'm not using <laughs> any kind of AI in my day-to-day -day life because it's like it's in if it's just a sparing partner to brainstorm ideas yes. and then coming up with some that I was missing uh still if I don't use it to 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 write full text still it gives me a lot of assistance uh in brainstorming yeah. and coming up with new ideas yeah definitely yeah yeah But but uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> let let me answer a question that you did not ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have uh, of course these fields where uh, now the teachers are complaining. All of our students they they don't do homework yeah. anymore because ChatGPT is doing all the homeworks. And of course, this is now a new technology. We had this in the '90s mm -hmm. when we started using the internet. That the teachers were saying, "Ah, oh, you know, people are going to the internet and downloading like uh, homework. Nobody's working anymore." <laughs> But it's just another tool helping yes. us. And for example, um, I'm not using ChatGPT to do all of my work. But um, these LLMs are already assisting me with writing English text, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm not a native English speaker. My English is not perfect, absolutely not. Uh, but whenever I'm writing a text in English, I have it proofread mm -hmm. by ChatGPT. Yeah. And it sounds amazing. It sounds <laughs> like I would write like perfect English. So there's no excuse anymore to make spelling mistakes mm. or ba having bad grammar even if you get uh, if you receive scam emails there's no reason anymore that scam emails look the way that they are doing yeah, because true. you can use ChatGPT <laughs> to write them perfect yeah yeah and so so of course young students they grow up now with ChatGPT and these llms and they are going to use it for good are not so good intentions, but it is going to be a standard tool. So it is necessary that they learn to use ChatGPT mm. to avoid yeah. bad grammar, to learn to actually ask questions. Mm. So in the future, they are going to use ChatGPT as a assistant system because you don't get your good grade anymore for going to a library and spending six hours searching a book yeah. because this process is going to be automated. Yeah. yeah, and so our educational system needs to evolve with the technologies that we are having. Yeah, definitely. And one other aspect that I um, that I was thinking about is many engineers uh, doesn't matter if if they come from software or or data, they often complain about like really poor requirements coming from stakeholders. And I hope that it somehow evolves and improves because of such systems, because it really makes you like more precise in your language because the prompts need to be precise. Otherwise, you will get not the results that you want. And I think everyone can now practice to have a really clear uh, <laughs> communication style. And hopefully it will also uh, will be a good result in, in other kind of areas we are working with, for example, in requirements engineering. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that we can also take uh, away from this is uh, usually if you work on any kind of task, it's always a great thing to have it peer reviewed. Yes. You have someone yeah. on your team working as a mirror for yourself yeah, and you show it to them, you explain it to them, you get feedback and together, usually if it's like a well-working team, uh, you create better results than you do on your mm -hmm. own. And now with, with uh, assisting systems like ChatGPT, you can automate that. And I'm not saying like we, we never need teams anymore or people uh, helping you with stuff, but you have like a, a very low barrier to get a first pair of eyes on that yeah. and I uh, here here I have uh, already like a vision of what is coming next mm -hmm. because ChatGPT and these LLMs that we're having right now they are amazing but imagine having a team of autonomous AI agents working together mm -hmm. because there you have exactly this um, this this effect right now I, I have like a task or a document to, to proofread and I give it to the AI and that gives me feedback And then 
I ask another question or I ask for a better feedback or I want it to be refined in some way. Why shouldn't I automate this feedback loop? Mm -hmm. And I could have two or three or four agents working on a problem and challenging mm -hmm. each others and uh, giving like feedback and uh, rework stuff. And they can work all day on, on this thing. And at the end, they give you like a refined peer reviewed product mm -hmm. and you can have people in the loop or not in the loop. Yeah, but th this is the next step that we are going to observe, that we are going to have autonomous agents collaborating with each mm -hmm. other based on whatever task you give them. So it's, it's not only this chatbot, what ChatGPT is originally designed <laughs> to be, uh, being like someone answering your questions, they can answer each other's questions and make their work even better. Yeah, interesting. Difficult to imagine that, but I've also heard uh, similar ideas about um, how to bring that up in software development, for example, where you have uh, like a massive talent gap. So we have, we have way too less people in software development and maybe, I don't know exactly how <laughs> and when, but maybe we can also solve at least a bit of this problem by using these new technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think so. Um, but but as I said, um, I don't really see uh, the the robots replacing mm -hmm. us or really filling uh, job gaps. I think um, the the job infrastructure is simply going to change and to mm. be evolved. Yeah. And so um, the the positions where we still need decision makers where we still need creative um, artists they they will still be there they are just going to be way more efficient yeah yeah and even though right now i could say uh, a developer who is mastering the art of ai assisted coding mm -hmm. is as efficient as 10 old school developers mm -hmm. yeah you could say it like i don't know it's like an arbitrary number and you could uh, apply this on a number of jobs mm -hmm. but this does not mean that we don't need developers anymore yep. the problem is if you then have this one opening or instead of 100 developers you want to hire 10 developers because they can work with a capacity of 100 developers you still need to hire these yeah. 10 developers yeah. and you will still have a very competitive market and you will still have problems if you can't fill these positions yeah and you still will need very knowledge people they yeah they know how to use these tools without that or yeah. they know how to develop software in general because otherwise if you if you still need to transport your ideas into a machine you still need to know what you want if you yeah if exactly. you don't know what you're talking about um i think we can imagine how the result will look like <laughs> yeah Right, right. It's it's a little bit this classical uh, problem with efficiency versus uh, effectiveness, yeah. right? So uh, you, you can work super efficient with an army of AI bots, mm -hmm. but if the thing that you are building is the wrong thing, then you don't get any benefits out of That's it. That's true. I yeah. think therefore we need now the soundboard with the horror style. <laughs> <laughs> with, with this one. Maybe not the right one, but <laughs> this always fits. <laughs> uh, really nice. So for all the people that are watching us right now, I don't have the uh, real number of the people watching us uh, currently. But if you have questions, um, share your opinions, please feel free to use this option right now. Uh, we still have time left and we can ask or answer your questions or take your opinion into the show directly. <laughs> So um, now we have talked a lot about the whole AI topic, but what what else is there evolving right now? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's on the one hand it's hard to say, on the other hand it's not really hard to say um, because right now everything is AI and every the, the only thing that you actually see in the news is AI technologies. But of course, it is not the only technology that is emerging or that is important right now. Uh, one thing. Um, that I also like to talk about is, for example, quantum computing. Mm -hmm. yeah? And this is something that uh, is already there for quite a while, like, uh, yeah, some, some years, it's, it's not that new. But the, the thing is, we don't use quantum computers yet in a productive setup. There are no problems that we are solving right now with quantum computers that we were not able to solve yesterday. And this is the big promise of quantum computers. Uh, because they work very differently to our regular computers. And so we have things like uh, 
uh, drug design or uh, some mathematical problems like encryptions where mm -hmm. uh, the physicists who are working with quantum computers say those things will be completely disrupted in the future because quantum computers can handle them the way that nothing in our universe mm -hmm. right now can do. Yeah, but we are not there yet. And uh, last, last week or the week before that, I was on the Quantum Tech mm -hmm. con Conference in London. Uh, this was very, very cool. With the Tech Review mm -hmm. podcast, is going to the, the episode about this is going to be uh, released in October. Yeah, um, we can we can we can also promote that if you yeah. like under your video, for okay. example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So if you're interested in that, uh, jump not right now, but then <laughs> jump to the Tech <laughs> Review and take a look at what is happening in the space of quantum computing. And this was super interesting because uh, we were talking there uh, with like industry leaders from an industry that technically does not exist yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, there are so many millions and billions of dollars invested in this in this field because everyone knows this is going to be huge in the in the future. And the big question of when is going to be that future, mm -hmm. uh, nobody really can can tell you because on the one hand, quantum computers are already there and they are doing stuff. They are just not doing the things that we want them to do. Right. So everything that we are using quantum computers for right now, we also can do this with regular computers, but way cheaper. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the regular computers are cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other hand, uh, you have uh, people telling you like in the next decade, it's going to happen. And especially now that we are having generative AI, we can maybe uh, increase the speed until we can uh, leverage uh, quantum computers. Mm -hmm. But the thing why I'm thinking quantum computers are so fascinating is because I'm a software engineer. I grew up with ones and zeros. This is the, the, the world that I know and I can explain to you exactly how we were using computers to fly to the moon. This is what we are using computers for. And now the physicists come and say we have this new generation of computers and I'm not sure if you are aware of how crazy quantum computers are because since the invention, since in the 40s, yeah, a little bit more mm -hmm. education yeah. for everyone. <laughs> <who doesn't know laughs> Let's that. jump to the since, past. Since <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, Germany in the 30s, uh, there was Konrad Zuse, and he was developing the first programmable computer mm -hmm. in Berlin, actually. Yeah, and, and this was huge. He had this machine that was kind of a calculator, and he was able to add a program. And so this machine was doing whatever it was programmed to do. This was new. And since the 40s, until today, until like here, the, my, my phone, mm -hmm. um, the computers are working in the same way, mm -hmm. the same math, the, the same mechanism of uh, putting ones and zeros into use and calculating stuff. But the quantum computer is not doing that. The quantum computer is kind of using magic. <laughs> and I, I mean this like in the literal sense, it is magic. I can't explain how it works. And the crazy thing is when you talk to, to a physicist, they say yeah, quantum mechanics, everything. Yeah, you, a lot of books about that, but nobody can actually explain how it works, why it is like that. And you have these effects of quantum entanglements. There are two quantum particles and they are connected to each mm -hmm. other. And one can be on Mars and one can be on the Earth. And when one is changing, the other is also changing. You can use this for communication. You can do the, use this for, for, for everything. There are even these, these theories. You can do teleportation by modifying things that are entangled with each other and moving something from Earth to Mars. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the thing is, the physicists can't tell you why that is, it is like that. They can observe it, they can use it, they build computers around that, but we still don't know why. <laughs> and so when we talk about Star Wars mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on my other podcast, uh, we, we laugh about that because it's fantasy. Mm -hmm. yeah? People are using the force yeah. to do stuff that, <laughs> that's like literal magic. But at the same time, we are using, using quantum computers and they also use magic in a way that we can't explain. And that's why I think this is one of the weirdest technologies that we are having in our hands right now. Why I say we, mm -hmm. not like literally we, but humanity. Uh, and we are still so young in this that we can't really explain how this magic is working. Mm -hmm. I think not yet, but I think there will be an explanation or we will find out how I it's working. So. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> or maybe it's really magic. <laughs> so like for this conference, were there many researchers as well and, and physicists? Or uh, do you think there were a lot more investors and people that really want to know when does this technology come, come to market and when can we, I don't know, make a business case out of it? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, as on every conference, um, there's the scientific or engineering aspect. 
and uh, the sales aspect. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> each company that was there also had their sales representatives and uh, showing their technologies and it was also a lot of sales. Um, but the people who were actually driving the topics, um, those were the industry leaders, the people doing the research, the people um, who are the decision makers mm -hmm. in these spaces. And so it was super interesting to talk to them exactly about um, what these companies are researching on and what, in their perspective, is the next step or the, the quantum leap yeah. <laughs> for certain industries. Uh, and this was, was uh, super interesting. Um, and what I also found very interesting, I, as a engineer or software engineer, um, it was a very different flavor of conference because as you said, uh, those are physicists or like the, the people who are actually in this stuff, mm -hmm. they are physicists. And so they have a different style of explaining stuff. They have different uh, worldviews. They have different uh, perspective or, or, or on things. If you go to a tech conference, usually it is, it is very different. Uh, I, I got like business cards on paper mm -hmm. i haven't seen this for <laughs> like 10 years because in engineering everyone only uses qr codes and uh, nf not not nfts like uh, um and nfc nfc yeah your field <laughs> with, with, with your smartphone because this is way more convenient but on this conference i got like a bunch of business cards <laughs> and that's still a thing mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah completely different word maybe that's I exactly mean, the like reason why we magical... cannot we cannot explain the technology yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. But, but I mean, put it in, in front of your eyes. You have this, these magical devices. <laughs> and the people who are steering this technology uh, are using paper business cards. Mm. This is kind of crazy. Mixed realities. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, but, but you mentioned it already, NFTs. So what about this yeah. whole Web3 <laughs> hype? <laughs> Is it dead or will there be a comeback? Because I was at a conference two weeks ago and I visited a panel about Web3 technologies. And I think there were unfortunately only 10 people in the whole room. And it was like really sad to see that like until now, it seems it's only a hype that vanished. But what is your take on that? Will it come back? <laughs> can we can we somehow leverage the technology in the future with some real valuable business cases? Yeah, w one does not simply talk about NFTs, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, N NFTs are kind of the joke of the Web3 space. Mm -hmm. And it hurts me very much because um, I was a blockchain enthusiast and kind of I already uh, still am. Mm -hmm. I, I still like this technology for what it is. Um, and it was never meant to be something else. A blockchain is a database. And so you can do things with it that you're doing with the database. It's a distributed database. It's a very secure database. It's, it's great. Mm -hmm. But it's just that. It's a database. Yeah. If you want to use it uh, to travel to the moon, <laughs> then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and the, this is what happened with NFTs. NFTs as non-fungible tokens are used as one tool in the blockchain sphere and you can do things like um, uh, signing stuff, right? You have a certificate which is un, uh, unable to be tampered with. This is valuable if you have, for example, if you own a house, you can have like proof of ownership of this house based on this blockchain without any paper uh, and, and nobody can take this away from mm -hmm. you. Yeah? Just as like a very, very simple, simplistic use case. or. Currency, the, the original thing that was uh, built with blockchain, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. yeah? you have like this distributed system of currency that can't be tampered with. This makes sense. Until people started printing uh, monkey images and <laughs> t told people that this is now a million dollars worth or yeah. something. Yeah. So it was basically this misuse of the hype and the technology that destroyed um, the, the, what's it called? Um, the image yeah. of, of NFTs <laughs> yeah. and, and blockchains in, in, in general. And that's why right now nobody's talking about it anymore. Everyone is glad that this uh, hype is already uh, is, is finally over. Um, but it's also a good thing. Um, I'm not sure. Do, do you know Gartner's hype cycle? Mm -hmm. That's like <laughs> one of the, the <laughs> golden things that we in innovation engineering always have to keep in mm -hmm. mind. Um, there was this big, big wave of, uh, of enthusiasm and everybody was using it for everything. And afterwards, there's this downfall, this very deep valley of tears, I think mm -hmm. it's called. And um, th this means people don't like this technology anymore because everyone or everything was oversaturated. Yeah. Um, but afterwards, there comes this 
time where people start using this technology for what it was yeah. intended to be. Yeah. yeah, and I think Web3 is not dead because the blockchain technology is still amazing mm. if you use it as a blockchain yeah. or this distributed ledger as it is supposed to be. And so um, if we take a look at uh, identity management, for example, uh, my digital identity on the web, it's right now very, very poorly implemented. I have approximately a thousand passwords and distributed <laughs> accounts everywhere. And uh, I have to type my data everywhere and uh, people are stealing data everywhere. And I don't have proof of anything. I have to get like a letter printed on paper <laughs> to my home address to prove that I am whoever I am, uh, want to be, uh, want to be. <laughs> you want to be? Want to be. <laughs> That's <laughs> the, the other way around. Yeah, I, I can't simply made up new identities. Yeah, but this is very, very um, old, a very, very old system of uh, identity. And using the blockchain, for example, for identity management could bring a disruption into this space. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were already there or almost there when AI hit. And so nobody's talking about it anymore. But Web3 is still a thing. Mm -hmm. Distributed technologies is still something that we are going to leverage in some way or the other. Um, and maybe even together with this new problem that we are creating right now, like deepfakes. Mm -hmm. We have AI right now creating also a lot of problems because we are generating simply everything that we can. Yeah, and uh, then there comes these questions, how can we prove what was the original? How can we prove um, who is the owner or the original author of text or images or music or whatever? So for this kind of problem, we might need something like a distributed ledger, something that nobody can tamper with, something where we can store uh, like digital fingerprints, watermarks, whatever, to prove the origin of certain media or data. Yeah? And so maybe uh, the blockchain or web trade technologies works perfectly in the future with things like uh, proving authenticity mm -hmm. of certain media. And then we are back <laughs> where we were, were with this big discussion about Web3. Yep. Yeah? So I'm, I'm pretty sure we will be able to leverage something out of this. Uh, but as always with these hype technologies, it's it by itself is not the answer for everything. Yeah, and I think the the cycle that you mentioned, I think that is also something that I experienced with data science five, six years ago. Like every company wanted to make data science, no matter yeah. if they understand what it is or not. And they started with their projects and then they were surprised, oh, uh, we don't have the data yet to make, to do data science, or we don't have the use case, how to, or where it makes a real sense. And uh, then also we had this downfall and I think currently yeah. we are using, um, like data science is not a technology itself, it's more like a practice. We use this practice in more, um, yeah, in a val more valuable way as we did it a few years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, Tarek, we are already so far <laughs> uh, like in time um, and already at the end of our time. But uh, it, it makes a lot of fun talking to you. And I want to finish like our talk with one last question, actually. And it's more like a transferal question, um, bringing it back to what I mentioned in the beginning with all the technical leaders that we are have in our community and Every day they have to uh, scout new technologies, but also evaluate them, how uh, they can fit in their current product vision and so on. So what would you recommend to them? How can they first keep track of all technologies? And second, how can they have like a good metrics for evaluation if a technology can be beneficial for their systems or not? Yeah, it's a very complex question and I won't be able to answer this in like one <laughs> sentence. Uh, first of all, you, you have to, of course, find uh, good sources for uh, um, like evaluations of technologies like the Tech Review podcast. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, it's, it's, seriously, I mean, this is actually a, a big problem right now, um, keeping track and on everything that is happening. Um, so you need to find like your, your trusted sources um, that aggregate whatever you need to know. You can't read everything. And in terms of um, how you understand or how you can uh, see what technologies are actually worth investing in, um, I have like one example that, that really was eye-opening for me, even though it was very painful. And this was with VR technology. Mm -hmm. I'm a 
big VR nerd, a VR enthusiast. I also have like my, my high end headset here in, <laughs> <laughs> at home. Um, but, and I was, I was totally sure in one was 2015, when like this new technology came out that this is going to change everything. Finally, we are in the future and very soon everyone is going to walk around with these AR glasses and, uh, you will see it everywhere. But the quick, big question that, uh, that you need to ask yourself is, um, what actual benefits in your everyday use cases is it serving? And even though we started using VR headsets uh, for online meetings, for example, yeah, we had like business meetings during COVID um, and we started using VR because we said uh, it's, it's way better to see each other, the, the avatars moving in a three-dimensional space as if we were at the office. After a short time, we stopped using it because even though it was a great experience, it is not really solving any problem that we are having. If you want to have like a quick chat with someone, uh, you open Zoom and then you have the chat and then you close Zoom. It's, it's way more efficient than going into VR. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I think this is the, the, the big challenge that you have to do with every new technology that, that you get into your hands. On the one hand, there are cool new things that you can do with it, but do you actually need it? Do you actually solve a problem that you need to be solved or do you create like new problems mm -hmm. that you're then going to solve without actually having it and if if you uh, ride the the subway right now you don't see people sitting there with their vr glasses typing emails on invisible keyboards even though they could do that but it's impractical it's it's way more easy to do this on your phone for example mm -hmm. yeah and so we are still not there yet that we lose our phone even though maybe in 10 years technology will evolve that we don't need it anymore. Um, but, but this is the big question. Yeah. So uh, even though I, as an enthusiast, I'm, I'm very hurt to say it like that, uh, but you have to be realistic or stay realistic um, and understand what actual problem these things are solving. And if it, if these things that you get your hands on um, are bringing you actually forward, uh, of with what we are, want to do but don't let it stand <laughs> in the way of, of disruption yeah. yeah because if if you only think in the in the terms of the past of the uh, of, of the already well-worn paths you will never see like the disruption where you say okay this does not solve any problem but maybe everything around that is going to be obsolete very soon yeah, yeah. so my question probably did not answer anything <laughs> it was a complex <laughs> question just... for a final one <laughs> I admit. <laughs> yeah. But feel free to contact me on, for example, LinkedIn, and I, I will be happy to like uh, continue this conversation uh, on a, in another forum or maybe uh, on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for your time. And it was really fun. Unfortunately, not many people participated live. So hopefully there will be some more questions coming up after, um, yeah, after the video is available on our YouTube. <laughs> so Oliver uh, was saying thank you. Uh, thanks, Oliver, for joining us. And thanks, Tanek, especially for uh, being here. And it was really great. Thank you very much for that. Hopefully to see thank you, you again and also seeing the other audience again next time. And if you uh, want to have more information, the easiest thing is just follow us on LinkedIn or YouTube, and then you will be notified when we are uh, planning new events. Thanks. Bye, Tarek. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Bye. You too.